Designing cars from scratch is hard. A car company puts a ton of work into designing, testing, manufacturing, and marketing a car. It's a lot of money, and they aren't going to get a lot of return on their investment until the car has been in production for a few years. Maybe they get lucky and they produce the new Beetle or the PT Cruiser, one of those cars that they sell a million of them and make a huge amount of profit. But what if it flops? Companies lost millions on cars like the Prowler, the T-Bird, and the SSR. These went into production, but people didn't buy them. The companies wasted millions of dollars and years of development on a concept trying to be different, even though they were all chasing the same nostalgia trends, but I digress. Because of this, companies hate making new vehicles. They'd rather revamp an old model and sell it as something completely new, uh, but that could be a video of its own. Let's say I'm trying to break into a new market, uh, but I don't have the expertise necessary, or maybe I'm looking to have more trim options so that I can sell more cars. The solution to my problem is badge engineering, and today we're going to talk about the two main types of badge engineering that you see all the time in the car industry and how badge engineering is actually found in all industries. It goes way beyond just cars. So first, what is badge engineering? Badge engineering generally refers to when a company takes a product made by some other company, does minimal changes to the design, especially in the functionality, but you print your own brand onto that product and sell it as your own. So, let's say we have a car, and this car is made by, let's say, Kia. And let's say I buy a bunch of these Kias, and I make the front end a little more pointy, put some different tires on it, and then slap my own brand on it. Let's call it the Calvin C1. But wait, wouldn't that be kind of illegal? Yes, doing that without the other company's permission can be illegal, but that whole thing is very muddy. I, I, there was a thing a couple of years ago where Nike was suing some guy who made custom sneakers. He took Nikes and customized them and sold them, and there was something about Nike sued him because of something. I remember Lil Nas X was somehow involved in it, but I don't feel like looking it up. But that's a little outside the scope of this video. But basically, companies can buy the rights to reproduce a vehicle and brand it as their own thing. And often these vehicles are made in the exact same factory as all the other vehicles. So if you, as long as you buy the rights and as long as you work it out with that first company, it's perfectly legal. Of course, why would the company want to do that? Well, it generally works out very well for the original equipment manufacturer, or OEM. You see, the OEM already has, has already done all the design work to make this car, they've got the production facilities, they've got this making this particular car down pat. They can make as many of them as they want. Unfortunately, they uh, don't have the capacity to sell all the ones that they can make. So often their uh, manufacturing is working well below its normal capacity. So if I go to them and I'm like, hey, I'm going to buy like, you know, a uh, few thousand of these and I'm going to make them my own, they can just ramp up their production a little bit. They'll sell me the cars at a reduced rate, of course, because I'm buying so many of them. And they'll actually, you know, they'll still make a little bit of money and they'll actually make more money than if they had just sold the cars themselves. This also works out for the OEM because they're trying to recover all that money that they invested into designing and making that car. For the rebadge company, 
this deal is great because you slap your logo on the car and you have a new model without putting anything more in than just the initial event investment to buy the rights to the car and the number of cars that you're going to purchase. You don't have to have this whole long process of designing your own car from the ground up. Of course, rebadging is not always helpful. If Kia can sell their cars direct to the consumer, why sell to me so that I can sell to the same customers and steal their customer base? That's why when you see rebadge jobs, often what they're doing is they're targeting a different demographic. Um, so they could trim up, the Calvin C1 could be a luxury car, and even though it's based on the same Kia, if I take it and I put luxury stereo systems and leather and all that nice stuff, um, wood grain dash of course, I can suddenly sell it to a whole other demographic that wouldn't even buy a Kia, therefore there's no direct competition. Um, I could also make the car a more economical option than the OEM. I could just get the stereo system, get all the safety features. It's a low volume production car, so I can do that. And I can make it the cheapest production car available in the United States. So again, selling to a different customer base. Uh, also, uh, let's say Kia was no longer selling their cars in the United States. Well. I could buy these cars and rebadge them as Calvin C1s, and even though they're kind of in the same class of car, I'm selling these in areas where Kia is not selling their cars. Like I said, there are two major types of rebadge jobs or types of badge engineering that you often see in the automotive industry. The first one you see a lot with big companies that own a lot of different car brands. We'll use GMC as an example. So, GM's model has generally been that Cadillac is their luxury brand. That's like their highest price point brand. And then a step down from that would be Buick. And then uh, Buick is sort of like an upper middle class. And then Chevy was the regular middle class 9-5 clock punchers car. And then GMC was known for their Econo boxes and their work trucks. And then of course Pontiac was GM's performance division. They were responsible for the first of the muscle cars. So each of these companies works somewhat independently from the other even though they all are under the one General Motors CEO. So when one company makes a good car, the other companies can copy their homework and sell it to their own niche audience. So let's say I'm Chevy and I make a mid-size SUV. What should, what should we call it? I know, there's a mountain in Vermont called Mount Equinox, so let's call it that. So we have our nice mid-sized SUV And I am Chevy, and it is branded as the Equinox. Okay, so I have my Chevy Equinox, and it can have all sorts of trim levels from Spartan to Sultan. However, no matter how much luxury I put into this Chevy, it's still a Chevy. And rich people, they don't drive Chevys. But what we can do is we can rebadge it as a Cadillac. And now I have a leg up in the luxury market because Cadillac is already known for their luxury. Hey Cadillac, what should, you, what should we call this new SUV? Uh, I don't know, Eldorado? Works for me, I don't see anything that could go wrong in any possible way, taking an old respected name and slapping it on some random new SUV or crossover that has nothing to do with the original. Anyway, GMC, you want to take this and call it the Acadia or something? Sure. Pontiac, take this and make it a performance SUV. Okay, well, 16-inch um, tires, bigger brakes, performance suspension. 
uh, maybe a turbo. Whoa, 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 hold on there. We can go with the 16 inch tires, but you can only upgrade the suspension if it has the exact same mounts as the Equinox. Also, no added power. Now what do you want to call it? How about Torrent? Why? I don't know, I just spilled some Scrabble tiles and that's what it spelled out. Okay, whatever. Hey Buick. Yeah? What do you even do around here? I'm really big in China. Excellent. You can take this and sell a bunch of units overseas. So now we have the same car, but each of these different companies can sell the same base car, which is all made on the same assembly line, to all their different audiences with their own unique niches and bring in the parent company a ton of money. So we started with one SUV in kind of the mid-market domestic, then we rebadged it as a Cadillac to hit the luxury market, and a Pontiac for the performance market, and a Buick for the foreign market, and a GMC model just because we can. This also works well for the consumer because they sold a million of these cars with all the brands combined. So even though I have an uncommon, uncommon rebadge, I actually have a Pontiac Torrent. The vehicle is exactly the same as all these other vehicles, which means parts, both new and used, are going to be very plentiful. Now, if I had some thing more rare that was kind of a more uh, one-off for one of these brands like Pontiac, then parts might be harder to come by. But because, you know, they didn't really sell that many Pontiac Torrents, but they sold a million Chevy Equinoxes, and I'm sure they sold a million others in their other brands. I don't even actually know. Uh, so it works out well for the consumer. So the second type of rebadge job that you commonly see can happen between companies that are owned by the same parent company but you most often see it as two separate companies that come together to form an agreement for one car. Let's say I'm a car manufacturer that mainly does trucks. I, I want to break into the lucrative crossover market, but everything I've made so far is body on frame, and I don't have any employees that are knowledgeable on unibody construction. To do this project myself, I would have to create a research and development team and I would have to build up everything from the ground up to be able to build my own crossover SUV. That takes a lot of time and money, um, especially for something that I'm not even sure if it's going to work out or not. You know, people buy my trucks. I don't know uh, if Mac all of a sudden started selling uh, hatchbacks. Do you think that they'd be able to find an audience for that? So, um, what I can do instead is I can go to some other company and just like when we talked about right at the beginning of the video, I can be like, hey, you guys know how to build this thing really well. You want to give me some of those so I can sell some myself? It's a great way to break into a new market and then if that car does end up being successful, I can always you know, build my own research team and start manufacturing my own vehicles, but at least to see, to test the waters, to see if this new kind of car is going to work out, I can just use somebody else's. So let's say you're American Chrysler Corporation, and it's the late 80s. You, you're doing pretty well uh, now. The 70s were a little rough, you know, you were known for those big honking V8s and American muscle. You also had some good trucks, including the Power Wagon, the first commercially successful four-wheel drive pickup truck. Um, however, with the help of the K platform and some engines from Mitsubishi, you had enough success to be able to buy a Lamborghini. Of course, that doesn't really mean much because Lamborghini was super cheap and didn't make any money. Um, anyway, it's the 90s now. And while the 80s was all about wedges and boxes, the 90s are now all about bubbles. The K-Series will hang in there for a couple more years while you're designing the new Dodge Neon. But in the meantime, you've noticed a major hole in your lineup. 
you've got Ram trucks, you've got Jeep SUVs, you've got the caravan, you've got plenty of sedans. However, you don't have any of those little fancy sports cars. You see all these Mark III Supras, Mazda Miatas, Nissan GTRs, etc. But you don't have anything to compete with. You could make a little car, throw one of your turbo four-cylinder engines, but that's a lot of work. You don't even know if people would want a car like that from an American manufacturer. Well, rather than spending a bunch of money on an entirely new platform, you can buy a bunch of Mitsubishi 3000 GTs, and you can put your own grill on them. Boom! You have the Dodge Stealth. The car that I know for two reasons. The first is the Brock Yates, Smokey and the Bandit reboot movies. And the second, a joke from my driver's ed teacher. Uh, he always told me, I used to own a Dodge Stealth, but I parked it somewhere and I can't find it. It was surprisingly successful selling 65,000 units. That's over double what the Dodge Neon SRT4, which was kind of its spiritual successor, sold. So, overall, very successful, but Dodge didn't feel like pursuing it any further. So that's the two major ways that badge engineering generally forms. Either you're selling the same car across all your different makes in order to uh, sell more of them, or you're looking to break into a new market on the cheap just to test the waters and see if it's going to work out or not. But before we move on, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my favorite rebadge job, the Pontiac Vibe. First, I, I hate the name. I don't know what Pontiac was thinking when it was naming things in the early to mid 2000s. Maybe, or mid, yeah, early to mid 2000s. Maybe they already knew they were on the chopping block and so they just didn't really care, but like, what is with the names? Beyond the name though, I like everything about it. The reason why is because it is literally just a rebadged Toyota Matrix. The Toyota Matrix is a small wagon uh, with the same powertrain as the Lotus Elise supercar. Um, it, ca it came with a manual transmission. Uh, the Toyota Matrix is actually the first car that I own. It's probably still my favorite. Uh, I should probably do a video on the Matrix in the future, but anyway, badge engineering can lead to some great vehicles coming from manufacturers you wouldn't expect. The Pontiac Vibe is very reliable because the drivetrain is the exact same drivetrain that's in the Toyota. Now, badge engineering is not isolated to the automotive industry. It's probably where it's most easily recognized, but it actually happens everywhere. The most widespread example of this is grocery stores. When you walk into a grocery store, you see a lot of your brand name products. These are for sale in every grocery store in America. Things like Pop-Tarts or Oreos or cereal or the brand names of cereal from General Mills or Kellogg's. These products are available, but then each grocery store usually has their own generic brand. So for every General Mills Lucky Charms, there's a great value brand Magic Treasures, or instead of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, it's a great value brand Frosty Flakes. These off brands are usually specific to a store. A Walmart produces products that are brand as great value. Um, HEB has products that may be labeled either HEB or Texas Tough. Uh, Kroger just labels all, labels all their stuff as Kroger, and Shaw's and Price Chopper have their own brands. Um, often, these products are made from the same company that makes the brand name products, and the grocery store just pays the company to print the grocery store's brand on their products. 
it works out great for the store because they can take all the profit from these purchases. It also works out great for, for the manufacturer because, again, they're able to produce a lot more than they are generally able to sell. And even though there is competition, the manufacturers are still getting their money. It also helps out consumers because the off-brand stuff is generally cheaper. The, the main example that comes to mind is batteries and batteries at Kmart. When I was younger, we always used to shop at Kmart, and Kmart had batteries, and they had, you know, they had all the major brands, but they also had these die-hard brand batteries. So they had die-hard brand batteries along with the major brand Duracell. And I asked my mom, hey, why do we bu always buy die-hard batteries? Why don't we buy Duracell? Because I remember seeing the commercial for Duracell, and the commercials for Duracell at the time were always like, oh, well, all these important people, they, they trust their lives with Duracell, you know, firefighters, EMTs, stuff like that. Uh, so I thought Duracell was the best batteries around and so I was like hey why, why do we buy die-hard brand batteries well my mom took the package of die-hard batteries off the shelf turned them around and started looking at the fine print on the back and then she pointed something out to me manufactured by Duracell company for Kmart the die-hard batteries were the exact same batteries as Duracell, but were cheaper. And the reason for that is badge engineering. So Kmart went to Duracell and was like, hey, why don't you make us some batteries that have our own brand on them and we'll sell them. And just like all these other examples of badge engineering, Duracell was like, yeah, sure, we can always make more batteries so that we can sell our Duracell ones, and we can sell them to you as well. 